Welcome to the Museum of Everyone's Pride of Everyone series. The Museum of Everyone is an inclusive portable platform for artists and creatives that aims to amplify a diverse range of voices and perspectives through both artistic and community-led collaborative initiatives. The Museum of Everyone is a space for potential, collaboration, original thinking and action. Our ethos is simple. If you support your community, your community, in return, will support you. To celebrate Pride Month, we aim to give voice to the minority groups within Ireland's queer community. With our esteemed guests, we will highlight ways in which the community compounds stigma and exclusion, but we will also explore ways to create a more inclusive and supportive community so that we really can have a pride of everyone. Hi. Um, welcome to the third episode of the Pride of Everyone series uh, with the Museum of Everyone. Um, so tonight we're talking about ethnicity. Um, so we have three great uh, speakers with us. Um, we have Darren Collins, uh, Dil Vikram Singha, um, and we have uh, Nikki Dubey. Um, so... Uh, Part of the reason that we're doing these uh, talks is to um, really to, to explore ways in which the Irish community um, excludes the minorities within the community um, and looking at ways that we can be more inclusive. So in talking about ethnicity, we're kind of exploring a few different identities, but we are aware that it's, it's really just we're trying to pack a lot into this and that there are so it's it's such a diverse area and um, and that there are a lot of ethnicities that have been excluded from this talk and um, and we we are aware of that and it is something that we hope to kind of explore further in in further series and to to try and bring more more kind of other ethnicities through the conversations so for tonight, um, I'm going to introduce our first guest, who is uh, Darren Collins. Um, Darren uh, comes from Tullamore, County Offaly, um, and is currently living in Dublin. Um, he, sorry, I should have said his uh, pronouns are he, him. Uh, he is part of the Traveller LGBT community um, and is involved in many different Traveller organisations. Uh, European Councillor in uh, sorry European Council in France, Pavi Point Dublin, um, uh, Exchange House Dublin, and is currently engaged with Hope and promoting mental health services, and is working for uh, a one sorry is working for one of Ireland's uh, most recognised cocktail clubs. Um, so I say it's 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 probably been tough for you during during lockdown, but um, Definitely yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so um, a lot of people will probably recognise Darren um, because he has been very vocal about his uh, his experience of uh, coming out within the um, within the traveller community. But um, maybe for for some of the viewers, Darren, maybe do you want to just uh, give us a bit of your your background and and yeah, just how that went? Thanks. So um, growing up as a traveller child um, was great would have lived the traveller life, um, was born in Reard and brought into a caravan, lived on the side of the road and lived like in a little campsite, it would have been called like a halting site really. Um, and then around the age of five, six, my mom got a house and we were in Eaton Derry for maybe three or four years after that and intended to move to the Isle of Man. Um, we were there for a couple of months, moving to the Isle of Man to Tullamore and had a great life there. Um, but in school, I never really got on with anyone. I felt like I was always an outsider, um, especially as a new traveller coming into the town, going into a primary school where you don't know no one, you've no relations, you're a complete stranger coming in. So that was very, very tough and very difficult. Um, so at the age of 15, I left school, I left secondary school, done my junior cert and left, and was getting married at 15, got engaged to a travelling girl. Both sides of the family didn't want it. So the only option we could see at the time was to get up and run away together. Um, but we were together for a year and a half. And unfortunately, things didn't go to plan. She went her way and I went my way. And then um, about two months after, I met another traveller girl. 
and we lived with each other in Avon. <laughs> um, we were always down there for a couple of months and then sure, that didn't work out. So I met another girl and I was with her for a while. She was in the settled community. And it was just when I was coming near 18, I started to realise I felt like there was something wrong with me. Um, and I started to feel I was attracted to men and I was like, what's going on? What's happening? Like, I should be feeling like this. I'm sick. What's what's going on? I couldn't I couldn't understand it. I couldn't come to terms with it, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and then coming there, 19, just between 18 and a half, 19, I started to suffer with depression and anxiety because I couldn't accept. I was thinking of the consequences of my face and the barriers I face within the traveling community. I started to realize, well, I'm actually a gay man. Am I going to lose my family? Am I going to be disowned? Am I going to be beaten up? What's other traveling members in my town going to be like? Because Tullamore is a small town, but it has a lot of travelers in it. Mm. Um, so unfortunately, I started to get really sick. The mental health started to deteriorate and I could hear voices in my head and stuff saying, what is there to live for? You, you're going to like you're going to lose it all and all this kind of stuff. And I remember looking at my mom in the living room one, one evening and my mind just clicked. It was like a bomb. It just clicked. I went upstairs and took an overdose and it was gone for three minutes. I was brought back four weeks later, I had a relapse. And was brought back into some more regional hospital and brought from there to the psychiatric unit to tell us I was just suffering with depression. So um, I had told the psychiatric doctor, well, look, I've done the job in the community, I'm gay, this is what's wrong with me. I'm actually not, you know, sick in other ways. I'm sick in this way and I need help, but I don't know how to like, say, say to my family or blah, blah, blah. So they wanted to put me on medication and this, that and the other. So I did, I went on medication, um, antidepressants and stuff before about two three weeks and I thought no I don't need these this is not this is not for me so um then I was in Dublin one night I went out on a weekend and I remember meeting a guy and that Saturday night I had a few drinks to me and I got a bus out of Dublin about two o'clock in the morning and rocked out at my aunt's about 4 a.m and she was like what's wrong is everything okay because I'd rocked up to her door at such a late time at night and I said, yeah, everything's fine, everything's cool. So I was there on the Sunday and I knew, no, I can't go on. I need to say this, I need to come out. So I texted my sister through Facebook. And I had said to her, I said, there's something wrong with me. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, um, I don't know. I said, there's something wrong with me. I said, the names people call me, the bully and I get over it and this and that. She said, what are you trying to say? And I said, I'm bisexual. It was just the easier way at the time to bring it out, especially coming from a traveling background. Um, so my mom had rang my phone. I didn't answer. She rings my aunt. My aunt answers. She goes, tell him to answer his phone. So I answered and she rang me and she's like, look, be home in the morning. I want to speak to you. And get the bus first thing. And I was like, right, okay. That was it. There was no nothing about like I accept you or there's this or there's that. So I went home the next morning. My dad met me and my mom and my dad said to me, you are my son. I'm proud of you. I love you. Nothing will ever change. You're amazing. Like it was incredible the support I got off him. Mm. But my mom was like, we talk about when we get to the house. So when I, when I got to the house, she was like, how do you know you're gay? Have you kissed a man? Have you been with a man? How have you experienced it? And I was like, no, I haven't. And then she's like, sure, you're not gay then. You've been with women. I thought you would have given me grandkids and taught, like, especially being the eldest child. She was like, I thought you would have got married. I thought you would have probably had a girlfriend. And, um, but it took about six weeks for my mom to accept it. But when she did nearly seven years on, she's given me full blown support. She's absolutely incredible. Um, the support I get from my family, my friends, it's amazing. Now, don't get me wrong, um, it has been a roller coaster, everything has been good. Um, four years ago, unfortunately, it's something that I never spoke about in the media before, but I think it's a topic while I'm in counseling, I can speak about it now um, because I'm LinkedIn with Hope, I'm engaged with Hope, and I find them absolutely amazing. They're an amazing counseling group, and I can't thank them enough for how far they've brought me in these past few weeks. Um, I lost my ex-partner to suicide six weeks ago and then four years ago on the 15th of May, the early hours of the 16th, 2017, I was unfortunately date raped in Grand Canaria. And then on Saturday night coming home from work, I had a homophobic attack where four lads from the age of 16 to the age of 18 had attacked me and fractured two fingers. So like you do have your bumps and you do have your bad days. Um, but you have to manifest in this life and stay positive. And no matter what you go through, and I know we all have different beliefs in religion, and I know our faith is all different levels, 
But without my faith, I'd be nothing. It's my faith that has carried me so far. And without my amazing friends and my family, the support that they've given me in these past few weeks, where there was times where I felt like I was on edge and I was going to relapse to where I was before I came out. They've given me the, the push to move forward, you know, and then getting a new job. And even though I was attacked after my new job on Saturday night, just walking home minding my own business, um, it is what it is. Look, two fingers can heal. Lucky I didn't get a slice in the face, you know, like at the end of the day, if, if, you, if you've got a mark on your face, it's never going to heal. It's something that you're always going to look at for the rest of your life, but two fingers will heal. So, yeah, positive minds. Yeah, God, I mean, I'm so, so sorry to to hear that, you know, the, obviously that you've gone through all of that, but, but even, you know, I, I think I, I, like for what happened to you last weekend, it really, really speaks to the value of, of just trying to expand these conversations and, and open up, you know, that, that, that this is still happening um, yeah. in, within it is. Ireland, you know, and we think of ourselves as being so progressive after the marriage referendum and everything. But yes. And that's what I was ready to say. Like people have said to me, oh, it's great now that like the referendum has passed and everything is opened and you look, he's getting great support from this and getting great support from that. Mm. No, we do get great support in different ways. But there is still homophobic attacks here in Ireland. Like, I am not the first. I've heard of many other situations in the past recent months and in the past year and a half since we've all went into lockdown and with this COVID stuff that's been going on, you hear a lot more of gay people being attacked and stuff. Do you know, it's it's, it's absolutely yeah. crazy. It's crazy. And there's not enough, there's not a law there to protect mm. us enough. There's mm. not. And especially with these teenagers. So you have, like, Gay, gay, gay men and gay women most come out at the later stage in life. So at their late teens, early 20s, it's later stage in life. So when we have these teenagers at 16 and 18 coming up and attacking us, if we touch them, we're the ones that are destroyed, we're brought to court and we're summoned. So where is the law there for us? Yes. Do you know, there's nothing there to help us in these circumstances at all. Absolutely. And we, were talk- we, we were talking about that last week in terms of... Uh, the, the legislation, you know, uh, around um, protective legislation, but mm. the, in terms of disability, that there's a lot that hasn't been included in, in those applications for, for legislation. But I just want to bring in, um, so our, our second guest is uh, Dil Vikram Singer. <laughs> I have to pause in between to get it, get it right. Um, so Dil, I, uh, Dil's pronouns are she, her. Um, and Dill is a social justice and mental health journalist and uh, advocate um, and is one of the co-founders of uh, Insight Matters um, and is currently a trainee psychother- psychotherapist um, and is also the proud mother of two. Um, so Dill, I mean, looking at what Darren was saying there and his experience of going through hope and through through uh, mental health and and uh, therapy and stuff I mean really that's what you guys are working with in Insight Matters so do you want to maybe give us a bit more about that? Absolutely I, I if, if, if you were here face to face Darren I, I think you, you, I would find oh. really good not to hug you um, because what you've been through is um, you know you don't, you don't deserve that you, you, mm-hmm. you know no human being deserves what, what you have experienced uh, but I'm really happy to hear that you you have your family's support. Um, Thank you. Because you know the way we are treated um, from our environment uh, it, it, it is how you know we internalize all that. You know it, it gives us our sense of worth. You know if we if we are treated well, we feel our worth is is high. So we start treating ourselves well. You know, but if we are treated badly, we treat ourselves badly. You know that's why sometimes you see people who are in an absolute bits, and you're wondering how can this person be in such a bad state? They're, they're not even able to shower you know to look up look after themselves from a grooming perspective but because that they don't feel that they're worthy of anything because they have been made to feel worthless by the, by the environment and that's what therapy can do because as was well my experience of setting up inside matters with my wife was because i too have had that journey like darren uh, where i've um I, I came, my parents were Jehovah's witnesses so i came out to them when i was 16 and uh, you know, as my, I was a baptized Jehovah's Witness myself. I was one of those people who, who you know, be 
come up to you knock, knocking on your door maybe or trying to hand you a, a watchtower magazine and and I had this feeling when I was 15 16 I was becoming aware of my sexuality and as it was kind of rising up in me I actually fell in love with a Joe's Witness girl I, I, eyes locked over the watchtower magazines and immediately I felt uh, an impending sense of doom because I had a, I, I had this sense that this I knew I couldn't hold it back. I couldn't suppress it. It was bigger than I was. It was going to come out and it was going to spell utter disaster. I really wish that my parents would have been able to see me as their child and put aside their religious beliefs, but unfortunately that was not the case. So at the age of 16, my family threw me out. So I was homeless in Sri Lanka, uh, absolutely no support whatsoever. Uh, and the entire family uh, turned their back on me. Um, and I had to kind of fend for myself in that stage. And somehow I managed to get myself back on my feet. I got a job in Sri Lankan uh, radio. I got fired when I wanted to be open about my sexuality there. And then at the age of 21, I left. Like many LGBTQI plus people, I was forced to emigrate. Um, and after a short stint in Bahrain, I found myself in Ireland at the age of 25. Now, interestingly, I'm so glad that I didn't wait around in Sri Lanka because homosexuality is yet to be decriminalized. So there's, uh, there's many LGBTQ people living in, Island, in Sri Lanka today who are not able to live openly and are because of the, because we were colonized by the British. So we have that, have that same clause um, that de decriminalizes, um, uh, that hasn't, uh, that decriminalizes the act of uh, two men being together, two women being together, mm. very much like, uh, like Ireland. So I moved to Ireland in June 2000 and interestingly within the first 24 hours of my feet touching Irish so soil, I found myself uh, dancing down O'Connell Street in broad daylight singing It's Raining Men. Because <laughs> my arrival <laughs> coincided As with- As every good lesbian show. should. Yeah. Absolutely it was brilliant. a complete and utter fluke um, broad daylight, suddenly I was like, oh my God, my first pride parade, I'm surrounded by a few hundred LGBTQ people. And I, and from that first day in Ireland, I felt I'd come home. And that's the, the beginning of my story that really shows that if one, if a person, now it hasn't been all rosy, okay? I've experienced racism, I've experienced discrimination, you know, triple glaze ceiling and all the rest in, in, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, but that initial sense of safety, that initial sense of, oh, wow, I can actually be myself has really helped me spread my wings and fly. And in relation to the work in Inside Matters, you know, because I've experienced so much trauma, I, I thought if I emigrated twice and got myself as far away from the trauma, I'd be okay. But it doesn't work that way. Where, wherever you go, your trauma goes with you. And when you least expect it, it'll come up. And sure enough, in 2006, I was, I had the job, uh, you know, it was quite successful. I had a, a bought a house, I was in a committed relationship, but then I started falling apart. And someone then recommended that I go see a psychotherapist. And that started my, my whole journey really in, in relation to living an authentic life because I reclaimed my dream of working in Irish media. I then started working for New Stock for 10 years and presented the award-winning program there. And then I met my wife, Anne-Marie, and she had the exact same experience as, as me when she, she's from Mead. And interestingly enough, we both had our mental health issues in 2006, even though we didn't know each other, but we both struggled to find an LGBTQI plus affirming a mental health service. So she was training to be a psychotherapist and we thought, okay, there isn't a service out there, let's set it up. And that was 10 years ago. Now I still have to pinch myself when I say this. I genuinely thought the practice would be just Amory as the psychotherapist and, and I would just send a few tweets and get her a few clients. Mm -hmm. Never in a million years did I think that 10 years later, we have over a hundred psychotherapists working with us. And together we have the privilege of uh, supporting the mental health of over 600 clients weekly, national and internationally. And we have a building now right next to Outhouse on Capel Street. So we have four stories, 15 therapy rooms, and I jokingly call ourselves a therapy hotel. Wow. <laughs> and I always say it's a little bit dodgy because it's charged by the hour as well. <laughs> 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 well congratulations it's i mean it's it's a real it's it, you know it's a real tribute to to where you've come from in your own journey but also to 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 meeting the needs of the community and and to bring in bring him back into the community and um, so i just want to introduce our our third guest uh so um nikki dubey 
Uh, and Nikki uh, is a medical professional who left Zimbabwe in the midst of a brewing anti-gay uh, storm in 2018. Um, and he has since gone through the uh, direct provision service here in Ireland. Um, so Nikki, maybe uh, do you want to tell us a bit about your story in terms of how you kind of came to, to come into Ireland and how the... the yeah, mine is a bit of an uh, interesting one because normally um, society would expect a medical professional, you know, to get a working visa and fly business class and land and be transferred to fancy hotels until they find their own, own accommodation in GC. But mine was different. I mm. actually had to uh, reset and start back from scratch. Well, a bit about where I come from. Um, I knew I was different from a very young age. I knew I loved boys. I knew I had fantasies of these big, strong men. And um, I didn't know it was called homosexuality until I think I was around grade seven when one of my friends would jokingly play with me and say, oh my God, you are so gay. That's the first time I heard that word mm -hmm. gay. So I went on to look for it and found what it meant. And I felt it related so much to me. Now, I didn't tell anybody until I went to high school and it was an old boys school. And oh my God, was I not the queen of the school. And unfortunately that came with um, a lot of vulnerability because some of the older boys would want to have their way or have their way. But to cut the long story short, um, my family kind of knew like it was a topic that nobody spoke about, but they kind of knew who I was until at about 18, um, my sister opened um, a letter, well, it was a newsletter from a, a, a gay organization called Girls, which is a gays and lesbians of Zimbabwe. So my sister asked me, what is this? About? <coughs> and uh, we were in different towns then. And then I told them, oh yeah, that's mine. Why did you open it? It says, why are these people sending you um, magazines and I said well I am like those people that's how I came out so she then spread the news to everybody who cared to release and she was furious with me for a couple of days but I tell you what right now she's my biggest supporter she will even she will even lash out of you if you look at me funny or if you make any funny comment so my when it comes to my parents mom and dad they never even confront not even one day they never stopped loving me. They never stopped who they were. Well, I, I hear rumors that extended family has issues or whatever, but mm. that doesn't rock my boat. As long as my immediate support structure is solid, then I'm good. Now, back to the story that brought me here. Uh, because Zimbabwe is very homophobic, even the president, the then president, the late Robert Mugabe, equated us to Western dogs and pigs and called us all sorts of names and instilled hate such that the society just hates you for being who you are. Mm. If you're gay and you're in Zimbabwe, you're at risk for so many things that could happen to you. Now, ironically, I was in love with one of the guys who had a very high rank um, government position, but he wanted it to be kept separate. It went on for a good while until uh, one day he decided that he wanted to explore and it wasn't with my consent. And there were other men involved and I was I, I said no so um, that's where all this um, imagine five men wanting to be intimate with you and you're refusing they strong on me they beat me and then uh, I managed to get off because I had threatened that I've got pictures of us and I'll post them so that the world knows who he really is that was my biggest mistake because he had, he had the, 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 the police force in his in the palm of his hand. The next morning when I got to work, my office was a mess. It was rain set. They were looking for stuff. They were looking for documents. They tore out my, my, my medical certificate. They, 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 they trashed the whole place. But I managed to be lucky and escape. And I made my way to South Africa. And I managed to pull out a few strings. And I made my way to Ireland. And trust me, this, the day I set foot at Dublin Airport, it was a day of fresh, it was like a breath of fresh air. I, I, I did an RTE promo about two years ago. I even say that I remember the line. It really was a breath of fresh air because I felt for once I can be unapologetically myself. And then mm -hmm. direct provision was something that I was not ready for. Mm -hmm. 
I thought I had escaped from uh, whatever I was running away from, and then got bundled again with the same people from the same continent. <coughs> look and think of you as that. Now, interestingly, when we got into 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 Dublin after a month, you need to be transferred to whatever center you are going to. I was being sent to another center where I had researched and I had seen a horrific stories that are written on the internet facility and I was like I wrote to them and I was like look I came here seeking refuge and you're taking me back and putting me back with those men that I'm running away from they never responded a day before I was meant to be transferred I actually made myself sick I had to that was my only escape I had to have an ambulance come and pick me up and go to the hospital that was my only hope of survival because I knew I wouldn't survive that other place. Because I'm diabetic, I just ate a lot of chocolate. That was enough to trigger my diabetes. But it put my life in so much danger because I just thought it was gonna be a two, three hour thing. I was actually in the hospital for a week. But um, on a lighter note, when I came out, I got transferred at least to a facility whereby I could actually be on my own and cook for myself and everything. And um, thank God and thank the heavens, uh, after a gruesome two years, I got my refugee status and um, I'm working and I'm happy and I'm independent. There is hope, but still I say, in as much as uh, we come to seek refuge in Ireland, there's still other loose ends that really need to be tied up and there's still a lot of education around stigma and racism that needs to be addressed because uh, in as much as people voted and the referendum won, but there's still a percentage of 40 something percent which voted no. And mm. it means that there's still people who don't believe that two men can be intimately involved in cold lovers or form a family. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's it's kind of horrific to think, you know, as you say, that you, you, you've you escaped and you feel this relief and then to be put back into that situation here. And and as you say, we, we kind of think of Ireland as being this very progressive and very inclusive space. And like, you know, what I'm saying about Darren and, and his experience last weekend, that, you know, this, this in direct provision, it, that's just kind of compounded into, into just such a tiny kind of system and experience that you know and you're, and you're you're being faced with that every day and I'm really sorry that you have had to go through that but you know um yeah look you know. It's, it, I, I guess it's it, it's the world in, even when in direct provision when I'd moved to that facility I suffered it was on the 2nd of November I remember explicitly I suffered a homophobic attack and uh, we lived in mobile houses and they were powered by gas and this one guy came and threatened me and hur hurling all sorts of anti-gay insults and told me that in his country they burn people like me. Imagine having to then spend a night in that facility. It was horrific. It was horrific. And what makes me sad is in as much as I went to, to, to report that, this is 20, 2021 and that was 2018. Nothing has ever happened. God. Yeah, it's uh it it I'm I'm there's really no words, um, so yeah. Um, well, I suppose it, one of the things I mean, you know, in 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 Dill saying that when when she got here and got to go out to Pride, that you know your first your first day stepping off the plane that you got to go to Pride, I'm kind of interested to know how you feel the 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 kind of Irish LGBTQIA plus community. You know, do you feel that that it's it it's more inclusive, or that it that, that there's more kind of stigma or exclusion and racism within the community, or are there is it is it in a different manner? You know, um. So so maybe, I, Dil, do you want to maybe talk to that in your own experience? So we must remember that the LGBTQI plus community is a microcosm mm. of society. So. Uh, just because we have experienced oppression and prejudice and discrimination doesn't make us immune mm. to to handing it to somebody else. Um, 
Uh, yeah, no, it, it still happens, but it's still not expected. So I know my first experience of, of uh, face-to-face racism, uh, where where I experienced you know racial slurs uh, thrown in my face, was in a gay bar, and that hurt more. Mm-hmm. I, and I have to be honest, because if I, those racial slurs that I have heard many times when if I'm walking down the street, didn't, wouldn't hurt me as much as they did when they happened in my own community, mm-hmm. you know, surrounded by my so-called brothers and sisters who, you know, we are all marching shoulder to shoulder for equality and whether it's for marriage or whether it's for gender, um, recognition or you know, parental rights, whatever. We, we, we have been marching shoulder to shoulder at these marches and protests. And then for some reason, um, we, we can still experience these you know, very intense feelings of, yeah, of discomfort, hatred, um, and actually end up oppressing other members of our, of our community. So for, for me specifically, I've always felt this, that there's a bit of a hierarchy in a in a queer community you know and if you're a young good looking gay man you're at the top of that hierarchy you know uh, if you are a uh, trans if you are a traveler if you're roma if you're black you're kind of you know just like you know, <laughs> at mm. the bottom of that and and that's really heartbreaking because because I'm, I'm i'm very interested in, in, in the topic of intersectionality you know and i think we are very, especially now with our new progressive flag, we have the mm. wonderful uh, Black Lives Matters colors on it, which is fantastic. But we are constantly saying to white people, you know, be, be, be aware of your own privilege. Uh, be, and, and where are you on the scale of uh, op- oppressor or op- oppressee? You know, and if you are on the side of the, of the oppressor, what can you do to use your privilege to elevate the voices of those have been, who have been pro- uh, oppressed? So the same goes for the, white gay men uh, in, in our community, what are they doing to elevate the voices and to rectify that imbalance that is at the moment? And, and interestingly, I'm, I'm noticing two others. <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a migrant lesbian um, and I have mental health issues. Again, not a, not a very sexy issue in our, in, our, in our community, but also uh, more recently I'm realizing very, we're very ageist. Um, I, I'm, I'm turning 50 in about a couple of years and I'm already seeing that happening. But more interestingly is I'm a mom. And I know as a, as a community, we love, I think we love pets, but I think we find children incredibly inconvenient. Because mm-hmm. I know when I bring my children into a queer space, like for example, I was sharing an event uh, a couple of years back for Pride and uh, our minder phoned in sick that morning and my wife was actually on the panel that I was chairing. So we brought her, our son was in school, but our, our two year old, um, she was one and a half at the time, came with us and she was on the podium. Now, if I had done that in a in a conference outside the community, <coughs> people would have fallen apart with the, oh my God, it's so cute. You have a baby on the stage. This is like coochie, coochie, coo. But the look of utter disdain and disgust of, from our, specifically, um, I have to say the gay, gay male uh, cohort, they were like, oh my God, this is just so inconvenient. Right? We're here for a conference. Why is this child here? Could somebody just get taken away? And I was really shocked at that. I said, I'm not saying that every gay person has to go off and have kids. That's no, I'm not saying that. But, but some of us have chosen to do that. So we just have to kind of move over and make room for each other. That's all we're asking. Um, just move over and make room because there, so many of us are, you know, we, we identify as LGBTQI plus but other parts of ourselves and bring it back to mental health pretty quickly. The only way we can live a full life is we, if we are able to embrace all of ourselves. I need to be able to know that when I go into, into panty bar or I go into a queer space that I can be all of myself and I don't have to hide either my skin color or my, my, the fact that I'm a mom or that I have mental health issues. Because then that, that's no different than being in, in a, 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 a mainstream space that I have to I have to conceal my sexuality. So that that's so these are, these are serious things. I think the the, uh, the community is aware of it, but I don't know if we are doing enough about it. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that about parenting, and I mean certainly age, ageism is a huge problem as well. But in terms of parenting, class, sorry, I never say I never mentioned class. Class is huge as well. Oh yeah, no, I know. The the, the more I do these conversations, the more I'm realizing that the, the really problematic areas and and the, the conversations that we're still not having and one of the, those conversations 
whilst there is the push for equality for children within the community and, and looking at legislation, which, you know, we, is, is massively problematic, you know, and, and doesn't, it, it, you know, it, it, it's not protecting children within and, and parental rights within the LGBTQ plus community. But it's very interesting to hear you talk about the kind of the, the, the stigma towards parents within the community, you know, that the, the, there is this kind of visible push for the, for the policy changing, but that there isn't this visible push for the actual inclusion within the community. Yeah. But I just want to go back to, to kind of what you were talking about as well, um, in terms of, you know, the, the white, quite pretty gay man settled. being at the higher. I forgot to say settled as well, because. Okay, well, well, I was going to bring in Darren, uh, because obviously, you know, to, to, to look at you, you present as, as a nice Pretty. Not, not that you're not nice, but you present as, as a kind of, you know, as, as the gay male, uh, you know, top of, of our hierarchy <laughs> system. <laughs> well, the thing is, I mean, one of the, one of the issues is then being a minority within a minority. You know, yeah, and, so. and it's something that we don't talk about. So, I mean, as as a as a traveler, in in you know in the wider society, obviously there's a lot of stigma. But then being a traveler within the queer community, how how do you find that? Um, for me personally, I find it very difficult, very very difficult, especially even when it comes to like dating. If you want to date a settled guy, it's like, right, your biggest fear and your biggest worry is like, when I meet this person and go on a date, how do I tell this person, right, I come from the traveling community, what way am I meant to dress myself, what way am I, what way am I meant to represent myself, what way am I meant to talk, um, you're constantly watching your words, you're constantly watching what way you speak, it's it's crazy, like, it's, it's, abs- it's unbelievable, like, I remember being in Dublin four and a half years ago, and I was dating this guy, from the settled community for about four months and a traveler family, we, were, we were out having dinner one evening a traveler family had walked in and he was like oh my god there's knackers in the restaurant and I went well that's not fairly nice like you know I was like that's not a word to use towards these people I was like they haven't said anything to you they came in minded their own business they were fairly quiet and um, I said so, look while we're here at this table and this topic is up I come from the traveling community Within that, he got up and walked away from the table and left me there with the dinner and the bill, the whole lot. And obviously, the I felt like, yeah, the bill, the whole lot. <laughs> Come back here, you pay for that. <laughs> but um, I obviously, I was sitting there and I was embarrassed and I, I was in shock of what had happened and I, I was fairly upset. So the waiter, the waiter had come over to me and like I had explained what had happened and stuff. She was asking, was everything okay? And fair play to her, she left the table and came back after about five, ten minutes and said she had spoken to the manager that she was fairly sorry that this had happened, like discrimination in the restaurant towards what had happened towards me and stuff. Um, so she was like, the bill is on us. You don't have to worry about it. Like, you know, okay. it's our way and yeah. sorry and stuff and whatever. But still, to this day, moving on, it's, it's very hard to find someone in the traveling community to date um, because dating another traveling guy, it's difficult because tra- travelers are being discriminated most of their life. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that our community know, well, the traveling community knows is discrimination. Mm-hmm. So when you have like a new community come in, the LGBT community, so this is the LGBT community is only coming into the traveling community in the past seven eight years i'd say it's only starting to get recognized so this is where we are starting to discriminate because they know nothing about it they're not educated in about it so it's, it's it's hard enough for us to try and find someone in our own community to try and date and if we do what what consequences could we face what is their family like with religion and how strict are they what has that person been through before they had come out mm-hmm. and then when you have the settled community it's like oh right it's the next step up so mm-hmm. it's it, it's terrifying. It is it's terrifying. Um, because like I find myself, I'm living in Dublin. Um, the last 10, 11 months, and a lot of people have said like, oh, I <coughs> by now and this that and the other. But I find the gay community has completely changed. I find 
I don't know if it's a good thing to say or not, but I find most of them are not looking for relationships anymore. Most of them are just looking for a bit of fun and bye bye. Okay. Do you know? And for me, like, I'm not on apps. Like, for an example, you probably have heard of Grinder and this, that, and the other. The first thing you go onto the app, I'm a person that will talk to anyone. I mix with anyone, no matter what culture, what race, where they're from. It doesn't bother me. If someone respects me, I respect them back. But to come on to the conversation and start a conversation with, with like a dirty conversation, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But it's not a way to start a conversation with someone. So like even going on the dating apps, they're nasty. Because you, is these people really behind these profiles too? Yeah. And how do you know, just very, very quickly, because I, I'm conscious of, of time, but how do you find the queer spaces in terms of, of acceptance when you're when you're engaging with with other members of the community? Do like do you initially face stigma or is it only after you kind of come out to people in, in ter- sorry, come out to people in terms of being a, as, as been from the traveling community? Um. Well, be- before I came out as, as a gay traveller, I would have faced stigma from the settler community, arena traveller. Mm. Yeah. Know, I would have got bullied and all that kind of stuff. I was bullied down to the years. Mm. Um, but now being a gay traveller, it's... But with it, it's, within it's, queer spaces, within within kind of clubs and, and bars... Yeah, yeah, it's 50-50. So when you go okay. to clubs, when you go, like when, if you go to the George, the Fante, yeah. You go to front lounge, I think it was. Yeah. Like when you go to these bars, it was 50 50. So mm-hmm. you'd have some people that would accept you and talk to you. You'd have some people that would look at you and be like, you're like a piece of mm-hmm. dirt on the ground, which it makes you feel small. So for me, I have not been deprived since 2018, 2017, 2018. I haven't been to a gay, I haven't been to a gay <laughs> bar. Like, and I had stopped speaking at, for, for Pride Month. And it's only this month I, I'm starting to come back out and start speaking mm. again because I'm trying to raise a voice in my community again and be that voice in my community because, mm. like I said, going into going into George or going into Panty, yes, we still do get racism and discrimination. Do you know? Once okay. they know who you are, it, that's it. The nail is on the head. It's bye-bye. Okay. And and Nikki, I know I know you, you've... You're, you're based in Sligo at the moment. Um, and I know obviously through lockdown, it's been difficult to, to get access to kind of queer spaces, but do you feel that kind of queer spaces, would you, you know, do, do you feel that there's, that they provide for uh, the kind of minorities within the queer community or? I, I, I honestly think it's about it's, it's, but it's people. Um, they set an open-minded people that really embrace and don't don't see beyond don't see color they just see a person i i just to 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 add on to what darren was saying i remember i was at one of the i won't name the bar but i was you know wanting to get a drink and i i leaned on the counter so this other bloke was with i think the partner is at four he pulled him over says be careful that might rub off on you meaning my skin color so <laughs> I looked at her, I looked at him and I said, yeah, it's still wet, so it will really rub off on you, you know? <laughs> oh gosh. I... And, 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 and then taking you back again <coughs> to my workspace, I work in the medical space, you get, especially the older Irish generation who would call you names, one for being black, two for being gay, and then they wouldn't want your care. But after realizing that you are the one they're supposed to see, they, uh, then, you know, so I, I, I really think, I really think uh, a, a lot of advocacy around education and acceptance and tolerance is what this nation needs. A lot mm-hmm. of healing, I think, a lot of conscientizing and uh, just a, a word to, 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 to all, the LGBTIQ plus people to say, in as much as you're in Ireland and we're free to be who we are, we still it, it, we're still not united as 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 people. Mm-hmm. In as much as we 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 preach and 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 want to be inclusive and want to be included, we are we operate exclusively. Mm-hmm. You know, there's camps. There's camps amongst us, 
And those camps actually will cause a very big divide if we do not actually address the problem while, mm. we, while we can. Mm. Well, I think that that kind of brings us to the last question in terms of uh, how, and unfortunately, I mean, there's so much that I would love to really delve into and, and everything that you guys have all said is, has been really, really insightful and, and really, you know, it really opens up so many different conversations. But uh, I suppose just the, the last questions, you know, like Nikki, you've just spoken about ways in which the community can kind of face up to to this, the, the ways that we are, we create exclusion um, and and kind of I'm, I'm interested to hear, you know, how do you feel we can become more inclusive, uh, you know, just 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 kind of to pinpoint one or two things that on an individual personal level we can all do. Okay. Uh, to begin with. Personally, um, as my own person, in the community that I live in, I, I, I believe, I, unless if I'm wrong, I'm the own, only African around, and I've been blessed that, you know, my, the neighbours around are mm. great people. So I try by all means to let them know of who I am and my culture and what I stand for and what I believe in. I participate a lot. Um, there's kids around Halloween. They know they'll come to knock on Uncle Nicky's door and there's a trick or treat, or whatever it is. That's how I've managed to kind of infuse myself to say, yeah. look, I, I, I am normal. I'm just of a darker shade. Um, mm. I am normal. I just prefer a certain sexuality. We, we understand. So I, I think um, you, you, you can't really force somebody to mm. accept you, but at least you can make them aware of who you are as a person and what you stand for and what you believe. Then the rest will be up to them to, mm. to then decide. If they are short-sighted, they will not see you, but if they can see beyond color, race, gender, and creed, then they deserve a pat on the back. Okay. That's a fair point. I totally agree. Fair play. And, and Darren, for yourself, how do you feel that the community can can really look at itself and become more inclusive and supportive? I think down to education as well. I think it'd be great like if education was actually brought into primary schools and secondary schools <laughs> and have children being taught at a very young age about different intercultural people, different ethnicity and minority groups, mm. and especially to LGBT community. For an example, like as we talked about earlier, like when I was a attacked on Saturday night by late teenagers what does other teenagers think of growing up and hearing stories like this mm. do you know it, like they're not educated enough it's not just about my, my own community my own community is not educated enough about it but it's every other different community it mm. education needs to be brought to school about this about That's bullying nice. about racism about the LGBT community about intercultural people about minority groups Mm. This needs to be brought into schools because I like I'd rather sit and talk on a topic like this than sit in school and talk about geography. Absolutely. What learn about yeah. what learn about mountains? What yeah. does it, what what's what's that going to do for you in the long run? It, yeah. I've I've done it in school for years. It's done nothing for me in the long run. Do you know? So this is where you could say, right, okay, this top CSPE or SPHE, maybe this topic is not needed. Boom, yeah. bring this yeah. topic in. Do you know what they can always it, it, these topics need to be talked about? Like, like Absolutely. I said, there's not enough education, and that's the most hurtful part because this is where these people, these young kids are growing up, not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. They think it's okay to go around and be like, here, you, you faggot, here, you, you queer, bang, you're gonna slap on them out because you're wrong for being gay. Yeah. No, you're not wrong for being gay. We're born this way. You just need to be educated about it. Yeah. Maybe yeah. when you're educated enough about it, then you could sit back and say, well, do you know what? In five years' time, I could have a kid and my kid could turn out and be gay. But I need to sit there and think about this because I have to accept. What if my child is bullied or attacked? Do you know? Yeah. So down to a lack of education. Absolutely. No, 100%. And um, sorry, I, I, I want to unpack that, but I kind of, we uh, just, we have to wrap up, I'm afraid. So, Dill, I suppose just on your, in your same question to you. Yeah, well, you see, I, I have been an educator, you know, I've gone into schools and delivered lots of training on inclusion. I worked, I'm, I'm an EDI consultant. I would work with corporates around creating an inclusive work environment through training. Um, but I, I do believe there's something uh, deeper uh, that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And that is self-care. 
So self-care is the greatest revolution. Loving yourself is the greatest revolution. So mm -hmm. at Inside Matters, our, our slogan is, you know, inspiring change in self and society. Uh, Nikki mentioned, you know, there's a, there needs to happen a lot of healing. A lot of healing has to happen in Ireland. The LGBTQ community, and even down to the lads that um, gay bash Darren, you know, what has happened to them to turn them into um, these, you know, uh, unfeeling you know, mm. individuals, you know? So if you can start with yourself and give yourself that self-care, that love, that we were constantly looking, we like as children, we are always looking for that from the environment. And unfortunately, many of us have grown in environments that don't <coughs> care. But mm. thanks to therapy, you can actually give yourself that love, give yourself that self-worth mm. that then and that then enables you not just to flourish from within, but also to feel empathy for the person next to you. And I think that's what's happening at the moment. People are so burnt out there, especially with everything that happened in the last 16 months, everybody's on their, you know, on their knees, hanging by their fingernails. You have no ability to see the person next to you is struggling. In fact, you might even go out of your way to be mean, mean to them. I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the last 16 months, even being in a supermarket, you see people are snapping at each other, they're grumpy, mm -hmm. they're pushing. They're sh that's because they're so, they're at their wits end, you know? Whereas if you're able to give yourself the nourishment, put that oxygen mask, question yourself okay, we treat our phones better than we treat ourselves the moment the battery uh sign on on our phones uh, mm -hmm. flashes red we're like oh my god where's my charger where's the closest plug point quick, yeah. quick fix, yeah. charge my phone and yet most of us are running on empty for weeks months and years so if you're treating your you know your self mm -hmm. self-care is not a, a a luxury it's a necessity so i really do believe education is really important but before before that you really have to give people that the message of looking after yourself will yeah. actually have a ripple effect and hopefully bring, bring about an inspired change in self and society. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And just to finish up, uh, how can people get in touch with Insight Matters? Oh, insightmatters.e. Um, Perfect. We're, we're, and we're on Gaple there, Street if you need us. Sorry? We're on Gaple Street. You know, I, oh, yeah. I, I call Gaple Street, Gaple Street. <laughs> it's the street in Ireland. You know? It is. It is. Um, and just uh, the organization that you mentioned Aaron was Hope was it H-O-P-E yeah, yeah H-O-P-E yeah they're based in Tala um, Tala Village they're absolutely incredible um, they saved me four weeks ago Brilliant. best council service I could honestly mention okay well we'll be putting all that out in social media and thank you all so so much for your time and so much for your insights and I really appreciate it and uh, we I look forward to hopefully having bigger conversations around this and I think this is really just been a, a great start and uh, thank you all for watching and please join us next week for our final talk in this series um, and we will be looking at sexual se sorry sexuality and sexual minorities within the lgbtqia plus uh, community so okay good night thank you <laughs>